William Shakespeare, a guy who knew a thing or two about keeping the attention of an audience, as he once said this. He said, the tongues of dying men force our attention. The tongues of dying men force our attention. And over 400 years later, his words still ring true, right? Why do we have a fascination or maybe even just a curiosity of people's last words? Maybe we're looking for hope. Maybe answers. Maybe assurances of, of life after death or what comes next. Consider for a moment a few of these famous last words. P.T. Barnum of the circus entertainment industry, on the day that he was dying, he looked around and said, how much money did we make today? Wow. Nathaniel Hell, American spy during the Revolutionary War, before he was executed by the British, as he looked around, he said these famous words. He said, my only regret is that I have but one life to live for my country. And Charles Spurgeon, great Baptist preacher, and the Lord called him home as he simply whispered, Jesus died for me. See, there's something about our last words that reveal much of our character, that reveal much of who we are here on this earth. So for the next few weeks leading up to Easter is we're going to spend some time at the foot of the cross. Scripture tells us that there's seven phrases that Jesus spoke on the cross, and our prayer is that we walk through each one of these over the next few weeks is that God will make himself even more real to us. Warren Wisby says this when describing the last words of Jesus. He says, these phrases serve as windows. They allow us to see the heart of God. These phrases serve as windows. What does a window do? It allows you to, to see outside. It gives you clarity of what's to come next. It prevents you from being uncertain. I can see through it. So these words that Jesus speaks, they're windows for us to see the heart of the Father. Because it's important for us to remember we can't get the cross wrong and God right. We can't get the cross wrong and God right. What do I mean by that? A few years ago, I was mentoring a young man and we were sitting down for coffee at one of our times that we met and he was telling me about his struggles. We were having a usual conversation, but, but something sort of hit me with what he said and I stopped him. I said, hey man, do, do you realize, do you believe that God loves you? He said, yes. With a sad look on his face, he said, but I don't think he likes me. He said, yeah, I believe God loves me. I just don't think he likes me. And it hit me in that moment that somehow he had got the cross wrong. Right? The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, what we would call the gospel, is he viewed as, yes, a step towards eternity, but he didn't view it how Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, that I only boast in the cross of Jesus. Or later in 1 Corinthians, where Paul says, the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to us, to us who believe, it's the power the power of God, the cross. It's not meant to torment us, to shame us, to guilt us. It's meant to remind us that God loves us. It's meant to reveal the heart of the Father. There's an old hymn we used to sing in my grandmother's church, and we've sang it here a few times as well. And the chorus goes like this, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. And how does it end? And now I am happy all the day. There's joy at the cross. Not guilt, shame, or judgment. And so friends, so church, is before we even begin today's sermon, is I just want to make something clear. I think sometimes as, as, as believers, but as people who still sin, is we sometimes think God is just frustrated with us. Like he's disappointed that our Heavenly Father is simply tolerating us. Ever felt like that? But the Apostle Paul in Ephesians says, no, no. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, he had a plan. A plan to adopt you as his son and his daughter. And a plan through the cross to make you holy and blameless and righteous. You see, the cross reminds us that, yes, God loves you, but he also delights in you, friend. Do you know that? So today we go to the cross. We examine the last words of Jesus. 
hanging there. A thief to the left, to the right, a number of uniformed Roman soldiers at his feet, and a, a great crowd around him. And our Savior begins to speak. Luke chapter 23 captures the first words of Jesus on the cross, starting in verse 33. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. They divided his clothes and cast lots. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus' first words on the cross were about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Consider for a moment what Jesus could have said. He could have called upon his father to, to judge them. Father, judge them. Punish them. He could have thought about himself. He could have said, deliver me, help me. But instead, we see a moment between God the Father and God the Son where Jesus is just making a plea on behalf of the men who are tormenting him. Father, forgive them. And our community groups for the next few weeks is, is Steve Jones wrote a great six-week study and, and we're studying Easter prophecy in the Old Testament. And what I love is, yes, the words that Jesus is speaking here, they're words of forgiveness, but they're also fulfilling prophecy. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12 says this, Therefore I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil, because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels. Then listen. Yet he bore the sin of many, and he interceded for them. He bore the sin of many, and he interceded for the rebels. In church, we're, we're reminded throughout Scripture that Jesus doesn't only offer forgiveness to, to those that were there tormenting him that day, but to every one of us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But here's the tricky part, right? I'm pretty sure that all of you have heard that, that forgiven people should be forgiving people, Right? That if I've received God's forgiveness, then I should extend it to others, right? That if, if forgiveness flows to me, then guess what? Forgiveness should also flow through me. But man, that's tough. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says, everyone thinks forgiveness is beautiful until you have somebody to forgive, right? How many of you know that to be true? Yes. But church... God is clear. He commands us to forgive. But we know it's difficult. And we know it's hard. But why? So today what I want to do just for a few moments is I want to look at, at some of the obstacles to forgive us. What, what trips us up as we attempt to do what God has called us to do and forgive others? What causes us to stumble? And my heart and my prayers after we examine these through the power of the Holy Spirit that each one of us this week we'll be able to extend forgiveness to someone in our life. And I want to be honest, though. Today's a tough sermon. Right? Joe Landy, who's preaching a similar sermon at North Katy, as we were working on it this week, we felt the heaviness of it. Right? This is not a sermon where we've got a lot of funny stories. Right? I'm going to have some great illustrations. It's a sermon that we're going to have a lot of heart work. We're going to go to Scripture and see what God says about this. See how it impacts our own life. And I know as we talk about forgiveness, as I know it's going it's to bring up memories. It's going to bring up pain of people who have, have hurt you or maybe someone in your life. Or maybe you've harmed someone. And you feel the guilt and the shame and the burden of that. So before we step into this, let me just pray for us. Heavenly Father, God, we first of all thank you for the forgiveness that you give us through your son, Jesus. And Lord, we know, we know, we know in our head that we're supposed to forgive others if you forgave us. But Lord, it's tough. We can't do it without you. So that our prayer now is that each person here, that you would speak to our heart and our mind. You would make yourself real in these moments. And you would give us the strength to do 
what we cannot do without you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what, what are some of those obstacles? What causes us to, to stumble when we try to forgive? Well, there's a few. I want to start with the first. The first reason is we embrace the wrong reasons to forgive, right? Simply put, is, is we do it for the wrong reason. Did you know there's over 80 passages in Scripture that talks about forgiving or forgiveness? And guess what? They all say how great forgiveness is, and none of them tell you how to do it. Thank you, God. It's like the Nike spiritual gift. Just do it right? But I think instead of asking the question of of how should I do it, we should first start with the question of why. God, why should I do it? Because if we answer that question incorrectly, then it's not going to stick, right? So So what are some of those false reasons we embrace? Sometimes is we think we need to forgive quickly because forgiveness is good, and if I forgive quickly, then I can be good. That's not how it works. Other times is we think we should, we should forgive someone because those around us are, are sort of telling us to do so. Maybe it's well-meaning family or friends that are encouraging us to do it. Because maybe, honestly, it makes them a little more comfortable to be around us. So we attempt to forgive someone to please others. You ever done that? And lastly... Here's one that I see a lot, even in my own life and in ministry, is we attempt to to forgive others and to do it quickly so we can skip straight to the end, right? If I forgive right away, I don't have to walk through the messy, vulnerable part of a healthy healing process. I just want to go straight to the end, right? All those reasons are wrong. And undoubtedly, each of us have wrestled with, with trying to forgive for those reasons, and when it happens, it just doesn't stick. We stumble. We fall. So why? Why should we forgive? One reason. Forgiveness sets us free. Forgiveness sets us free. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul talks about the freedom that we've been given in Jesus Christ, and he says, for freedom, Christ set us free. So stand firm then. Don't submit again to that yoke of slavery. Forgiveness is designed to set us free. So we no longer have the yoke of unforgiveness around our neck. I want to I introduce you to someone. You can see on the screen here in a moment, it's the newest addition to the Flurry family. Raider Michael Flurry. We were the family who got a dog for Christmas. Because we didn't have enough going on in our life, let's add another life to take care of, right? Uh, but Raider's a German Shepherd. We love dogs. We have another black lab. Uh, and he is adopting well or adapting well to life in the flurry home, right? My wife calls him a velociraptor because he eats and chews everything, right? I mean everything, right? Uh, she gets frustrated because the only person he listens to is me, right? Uh, he thinks everybody else in the house is a big toy. But one of the things that he continues to struggle with is, is this. It's his collar and his leash, and part of our responsibility, especially my kids, is to, to walk him to make sure he can burn off that energy. And, and sometimes as we put this leash and this collar on him, as he takes off, we have to stop, we have to pull him back to our side. Hey, Raider, come here, come here, buddy. Other times, he's getting better at this, is we'd put this on and we'd walk outside and he would freeze. Almost like he was paralyzed. Like, I don't want to be drug around anymore. The weight of this is too heavy. But church, I think for a lot of us, is we've got a spiritual collar like this around our neck. And if we look at the leash that holds it together, we would see bitterness and anger, judgment, jealousy. And all of it is tied to this collar called unforgiveness. I want you to listen to Paul's words. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. He says it doesn't have to be this way. He says, let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Friends, here's what I know is is for many of us is, is a collar of unforgiveness and the leash with all those attributes have been weighing on you and paralyzing you for months and years. After last service, I had a man come up to me with tears in his eyes, and he said, it took me over 12 years to finally get rid of that collar. 
12 years. Dr. Tim Jennings, a Christian psychiatrist, and uh, he specializes in, in researching biblical principles, in essence, with the human brain, he wrote a great book called The God-Shaped Brain. And he said this, after decades of therapy with thousands of people, listen to what he says. When someone does you wrong, when someone does evil against you, a seed of resentment, a seed of anger, a seed of bitterness is placed in your heart. And if you don't root that seed out, like any seed, it begins to grow. And quite often as we fertilize it with our anger, with our desire for revenge or payback, and ultimately we begin to become like the person who harmed us. But when you forgive someone, the person who did you harm, the person who did the wrong, they are not changed. The act of forgiving changes and heals the one who was harmed. You are the one set free. You are or the one set free. Friends, the only path to freedom, the only way to get rid of the leash and the collar is to walk in the freedom that God gives you in his forgiveness. That's why he commands us. That's why you see those 80 passages of scripture that he talks about forgiving and forgiveness because he loves you. He doesn't want to see a yoke of unforgiveness around your neck. He wants to see you free. That's the first obstacle. So we try to forgive for the wrong reasons. The second is because we believe a lot of myths about forgiveness. You know that? Even the past few weeks when I was talking to friends and staff members about, about forgiveness, there's a lot of myths that surround it. I mean, if you Google how to forgive, you're going to get a couple of good answers and some really bad ones, okay? Because there's a lot of myths surrounding that. And so I want to take some time today and, and hit a few of these. Because I see many times that these prevent us from experiencing the freedom that comes from forgiveness because we believe these. The first is this. Here's a myth we believe. Forgiving means forgetting. How many of you heard that? Forgive and forget. Anybody heard that? It's not possible. Forgiving does not mean forgetting. Who in the room knows what an Etch-A-Sketch is? Right? Kids, you don't know. Ask your parents later. They can show you it was a little toy. and You could play with it and draw with it. When you messed up, all you had to do was what? Shake it. Shake it. And now you're, the slate is clean. That's not how our brain or our heart works. Do you know that? And I know people will say, well, Brad, do you remember in, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, where it says that, that God says, I will remember their sins no more. Friends, I want you to know that God is all-knowing. God has not forgotten your sins like you forgot where you put your keys or your kid can't find their cell phone. No, he's telling us there that he chooses not to hold our sins against us. That based upon his grace and his mercy and the abundance of his love, that those have placed their faith in him for salvation, that he separates us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. Right? Forgiving is not forgetting. In fact, if, if you've walked with someone that's experienced something traumatic, to tell them they should simply just forget that, that's in no way healthy or even compassionate part of the healing process. The key is not to erase the past, but it's to learn how to honor God when past memories seek to infringe upon our current awareness, right? You know, one of my favorite stories in Scripture of, of forgiveness, with the exception of Jesus' words on the cross, is Jacob's son, Joseph. Joseph was one of 12 brothers, and, and he was, uh, the problem was, is he was the favorite, right? Anybody here the favorite sibling, right? A couple of you, right? Any, anybody, anybody not, right? S Stephen, you're not. Right? Gil, you're not. No, Gil, you are the favorite. I know that. Uh, a few others, right? right? You know, well, here's the deal. He had 12, 13 brothers. He was his dad's favorite, his brothers didn't like that. And so you talk about an intense sibling rivalry as you can go to Genesis chapter 37 and, and read all this through, through most of the, uh, the book of Genesis. I don't have time today to describe it. But they decided to get back at him. So they're going to kill him. So one day they're out in the field and they capture him and they throw him in this big pit and they were going to leave him there to die. But then one of the brothers, is, maybe he felt a little compassionate or he just want to make some money. He said, let's just sell him to slavery. So for 20 pieces of silver as they sold their brother, and the slavery. They went back and told their dad that he had been killed by a wild animal and his dad was sad. 
But you fast forward for many decades and, and through a series of events that can only be described as God's hand upon Joseph's life, as he then rises to be the number two man in the land of Egypt. And then a famine happens, a drought. And now Joseph's brothers have to go stand before him. Listen to what he says. Genesis chapter 50, starting in verse 18. His brothers also came to him, and they bowed down before him, and they said, We are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me, but God planned it for good to bring about the present result. You see, Joseph did not forget their sin. In fact, he brings it up, not in a nagging way, right? He didn't say, like, listen, guys, you threw me in a pit, and then you sold me, and you lied to our dad. No, but he said, you planned evil against me. I remember that. It hurt. You can read in Genesis, there were times where he was crying when he was seeing his brothers there. He said, but, but God planned it for good. Last week, I was talking with Susan Sal, who's our family freedom minister, about this and then this, this encounter of forgiveness. And she reminded me of something so important. She said this. She said, Brad, Joseph was able to, to speak these words of forgiveness because he had encountered God's powerful grace over and over since the time his brothers tried to kill him. And this teaches us something, she said. It teaches us that when we invite God into our pain, is part of his healing is to give us a different perspective of our pain. So we invite God into our pain. Part of his healing process is to give us a different perspective of our pain. So Joseph can stand there in front of his brothers with all integrity and say, yes, I remember what you did to me, but I forgive you. What you planned for evil, God planned for good. Forgiving does not mean forgetting. Myth number two, this is a tough one. Forgiveness means reconciliation. That's a myth that many times we believe. Friends, I want to be clear. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. So what's the difference? Simply put, is forgiveness is unconditional. Reconciliation is conditional. What do I mean? Forgiveness is unconditional. The offender doesn't have to do anything. They don't have to apologize. They don't have to ask for your forgiveness. They don't have to make things right. In fact, I was talking to someone at the Connection Center after last service, and he, they said, you know what, Brad, you're exactly right. I had to forgive somebody that had already passed away. That person had never said anything to me. They never apologized. But through God's work in my life, I forgave them. Unconditional forgiveness. But guess what? I don't know about you, but man, that's not fair. Do you know that? Forgiveness is not fair. There's nothing fair about it, right? The world says that what's fair is I should be able to get you back, right? I should be able to make you pay for what you did to me or those in my life. So we get upset. We say, God, this, this is not fair. I'm having to do all the work here. And God goes, yep. You like it when I'm not fair to you though, right? See, God is always just, but God is not fair. Brad, what do you mean by that? Listen to this. Psalms 103. God, he has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. What's that saying? God is not giving us what we deserve. He's not being fair. He's not dealt with us as our sins, what? Deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward us those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Friends, forgiveness is unconditional. It's not the same as reconciliation. Reconciliation is conditional. It requires conditions. What are some of those? For example, it, it typically requires genuine repentance by someone who's done something wrong. That they're willing to accept the consequences of, of whatever has happened along the way. And then there's a desire by both parties to move forward. Reconciliation is a beautiful thing. But reconciliation doesn't bring things back to how it used to. Reconciliation means we agree on how things are going to be going forward. But it's different than forgiveness. Some of you know a little bit about my story and others know a lot. My dad and I never had a great relationship. My parents divorced early in life. 
my father was, was in and out of prison and, and caused some difficult times for our family. Many of the scars from that time frame are still visible in, in the life of, of those close to us. And as I got older, as, as my father and I rarely spoke, in fact, I've only seen him a few times uh, as an adult. Hasn't spoken or seen in, in decades. But when Liz and I were pregnant 18 years ago with our first son, Hunter, is God began to wrestle with me. He told me very clearly that, Brad, before you become a dad, I need you to forgive your dad. I didn't like that. God, that's tough. But he said, Brad, for you to be the kind of dad and husband that I need you to be, for you to love and lead your family well, I need you to put down that collar of unforgiveness and to experience the freedom of forgiveness. I'm not going to go into all the details of the conversation, but I made a phone call to my father. And I want you to know as I've, I've forgiven my dad on that day, I forgave my father. But we do not have a restored relationship. We have a peaceful relationship. I don't hold ill feelings against him. I don't have bitterness or anger in my heart anymore. But I've chosen healthy boundaries for my family. And as it says in Romans, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So that's been my goal. Forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. Lastly, our myth is this. I can do all this on my own. I can do all this on my own. Friends, this week, as Joe Lenny and I prayed about this message, a big part of it was hoping that you would hear us say that this is not easy, right? Forgiveness is not easy. What's easy is to hold a grudge. What's easy is to keep a chip on my shoulder. What's easy is for me to live with bitterness to those around you. Easy is to wish for the worst to someone that's hurt you the most. Forgiveness is hard. and We can't do it on our own. We can't do it without Jesus. The Gospel of Luke captures a moment where Jesus is teaching his disciples and, and he's telling them, he's like, life is going to be tough. People are going to betray you. They're going to cause harm to you, to those you love. Listen to what he says in Luke chapter 17. He said to his disciples, offenses will certainly come, but woe to the one through whom they come. And he tells them later, he says, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Can you imagine the disciples hearing this? If they're like me or maybe like you, they're like, okay, God, here's the deal. Jesus, I understand what you're saying, right? Somebody's going to do something to me, right? Or, or man, better not to my family. I'll give you one. One, and then I forgive you, right? Maybe two in a lifetime, not seven in a day right? And he tells them, you will do this seven, maybe seven times seven. And what I love is the powerful response from the disciples. Three words. They heard the command from Jesus and they responded with three words. Increase our faith. Increase our faith. Earlier, I told you about Charles Spurgeon's last words. I read a commentary this week, and, and he talked about this passage of Scripture. And now it's amazing, when you look at all of Scripture, out of everything that the disciples could have said, Lord, increase our faith on, it was this one. Here's what he says. It was not for the sake of working miracles that the apostles sought increased faith. It was not in order to bear the present or future trials. Neither was it to enable them to receive some type of mysterious article of faith, but their prayer referred to a common, everyday duty required by the gospel, the forgiving those who do us wrong. Friends, if, if you're surprised at the high standard of forgiveness that Jesus is calling to, then my prayer for you, my prayer for me, for all of us, is we'll do exactly what the disciples did, is we'll go back to the one who gave us the command and say, increase our faith. Some people say forgiveness is a process. Some say it's a decision. Some say it's steps along the way, and I think it's probably a combination of all of that. But here's what I certainly know. We can't do it without Jesus Christ. We can't do it alone. As we close today, I just want to share one story of 
power of forgiveness. Many of you have heard of Corrie Ten Boom. Her and her family lived in in Nazi-occupied Germany at that time. She wrote a great book called The Hiding Place because her and her family is what they did is they would would hide the Jews that were escaping the Nazis. Well, unfortunately, her family was caught and sent to a concentration camp, and she had to walk through that miserable time, and her sister, Betsy, actually died there. Years later, after she was released from the concentration camp and the war was over, she was speaking at a church. She was speaking at a church, and I want to read you her words. She said, when I began speaking, I saw him, a heavyset man in a gray overcoat, a brown hat clutched between his hands. One moment, I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform, a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. Memories of the concentration camp came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh lights, the pathetic pile of clothes in the middle of the floor, the shaming of walking naked past this man over and over. I could see my sister's frail form of head of me, ribs protruding from her body. This man had been one of the most ruthless guards at the concentration camp where we were sent. She then goes on to share that as soon as she was done speaking, as she made her way down front, and and like typically as people came by to talk to her, this man stayed at the back and then slowly made his way up to Corey. She said, I didn't know what to do. As, as, As my blood didn't boil, it actually froze. She said, the man came and with his head down, just began to speak softly. And he said, I was a guard at the concentration camp where you and your family were. Since then, I've come to know Jesus as my Savior, and and God has forgiven me. I'm coming to you today to say I'm sorry and ask for your forgiveness as well. Corey said this. She said, I stood there and I could not speak. Betsy, my sister, had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death just by asking? She said it couldn't have been seconds, but it felt like hours as she just stood there. She said, I knew what I had to do. I knew what God required of me. She said, forgiveness is an act of the will, and will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. So she said, I said, Jesus, you have to help me. She said, she said a prayer and said, Jesus, I'm simply going to raise my hand, and you have to do everything else. So she slowly raised her hand, and in a moment, he grabbed hers. She said, immediately she felt the Holy Spirit come upon her and a warmth, almost sensation, she said. And she said she began to cry. And she said, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you with all my heart. And now the prisoner and the guard stood there in front of all the people and began to cry and hug. Corey ends the chapter of this book and she said, I've never known God's love so intense than in that moment in my life. The freedom of forgiveness. So what does this look like for us today? A sermon like this is, is what's the decision points? I think there's a couple. Number one is maybe there's those that are in this room or in the courts or watching online. And and in the beginning of the sermon, when we talked about Jesus' words of forgiveness and the salvation offered to us, is maybe you've never experienced that. Because maybe you think the sins that you've committed in your life are too big. The enemy continues to whisper to you, Guilt and shame. No God could ever love you. No God could like you. Friends, can I tell you that's a lie from hell? That our Heavenly Father, through His Son Jesus, has erased your sins and He sees you through the righteousness and the sacrifice of His Son. Today, you can step into that kingdom. But for a lot of us here, is today when I was speaking, is, is you probably thought of someone who harmed you. And there's been a yoke, there's been a collar of unforgiveness around your neck for a long time. And you don't want to lay it down. I've been there. I like the power and control of keeping this because this person owes me and they should pay. There's no freedom in that. My prayer is that you can lay that down at the foot of the cross today. That the forgiveness that God has put in you can then be given to others. So in a moment, John is going to sing. I'm going to say a quick quick prayer, and there's going to be some leaders up front. Whatever God may be doing on your heart, 
Don't leave here today with a collar of unforgiveness still paralyzing you. Heavenly Father, can we thank you again for the gift of forgiveness that you have given us. The gift of forgiveness that allows us to forgive those that have harmed us. But God, we know we can't do this alone. So we pray like the disciples did. Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. And in doing so, may we be instruments of forgiveness for you. In Jesus' name.